Hey, it's Dan Melnick. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zing, and I'm proud to be a sponsor of this podcast. So please check us out today as we can help fuel your business growth. MyZing.io. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Ahmad. Hello there. How are you? I'm great, sir. How are you? Doing good? Firstly, thank you very much uh, for giving me opportunity to interview you for my YouTube channel and podcast and for my channel. My pleasure. So I've gone through your profile. I can see uh, you're doing a lot of work. So I thought to tell about your work to my audience. Yeah, I, uh, I'm doing all kinds of things, uh, writing about my travels, talking about energy, and then, of course, writing on a variety of other social and political issues. So uh, before talking more about uh, you and the work that you're doing, can you please introduce yourself to my audience? Yes, certainly. I'd be happy to do that. I was uh, born and raised in Pakistan and uh, spent uh, my first 21 years there. I studied economics at the University of Karachi, and then I came to the U.S., to study economics uh, for my doctoral program at University of California at Davis. I graduated uh, in 1979, and then I worked in a number of different energy organizations until the year 2021, and then I retired at the end of 2021. So since 22 onwards, I have uh, still been active uh, in a lot of different areas, uh, writing, giving presentations, and uh, discussing these issues with friends, neighbors, and relatives. So uh, what made you to come into energy field and uh, econo study and economics? So it was a, a, like a not a planned event. It was just a, a coincidence. So originally, I was going to become an engineer. And then I realized that I really didn't have a lot of aptitude for laboratory project work. I like the theory, but not the project work in the, in the laboratories. Physics and chemistry uh, were a challenge for me. So most of my family members were in the engineering field, but I uh, didn't quite fit that mold. And so then I wanted to uh, joined the military. I, I was always fascinated with defense issues, and I wanted to join the Pakistani army and the armored corps. But uh, for whatever reason, they thought I was medically unfit because I had flat feet and knocked knees. And so that was no longer an option. And finally, I thought, okay, what should I do? So a professor who was a relative of mine suggested that I go for the civil service which was a very elite organization in Pakistan. And what they required was that you take a competitive exam once you have a master's degree in some subject. <laughs> it could be any subject. And so somewhat randomly, economics was chosen to just be a bridge towards getting that competitive exam and then becoming a magistrate or a commissioner or whatever. Well, uh, long story short, once I started studying economics at the University of Karachi, I kind of fell in love with the subject. And I decided that I didn't want to become a civil servant. I wanted to become a professor of economics. And that required a PhD. So that meant coming to the US. And once I was doing my economics doctoral work, the energy crisis happened in California and, and throughout the globe, actually. California created the California Energy Commission to manage energy growth and to promote conservation. And that's how I ended up in the energy field, because they offered me a position there first as a summer student and then later on as a postgraduate researcher. So then I ended up writing my dissertation on energy issues in California, and then found a job in the energy field, and then just focused on electricity economics from that point onwards. But I still had other interests, including defense and uh, being an economist, also looking broadly at politics and um, sociology, all of those issues that are part of social science. 
1999, I started writing on these other issues while working on energy issues from nine to five, let's say. So this became my hobby, writing articles on a variety of issues in newspapers, uh, magazines, uh, journals, what have you. So that's my career, if you will. So economics, so how much you understood in these years? How much did I understand economics? Yeah, how much you understood? Well, uh, it's a very difficult subject. Uh, there's a story that even Albert Einstein tried his hand at economics and realized it was too difficult, so then he went into physics. Who knows if it's true or not, but certainly economics, uh, I think I understand it reasonably well, uh, but there are many difficult issues that nobody understands in economics, and so that's why it continues to be as much of an art as a science. And energy field. How much you understood uh, exploring things and uh, uh, giving uh, the result? So I focused on the consumer side of energy issues. Why are the bills so high? What can be done to lower the bills? And that became my focus. So I did a lot of work on uh, issues dealing with the customer in terms of energy. And I also realized that a lot of these new issues required us to do experiments. So a good portion of my career was spent designing experiments with new electricity pricing options involving customers and testing them using econometric methods. And so that was a good chunk of my work was not theory, but practice. And within practice, it was not just conversations, even though conversations were important with customers, Ultimately, it was about experiments, people living their lives with something new and different to, so that we can learn from how, whether they like it or not, and whether they are willing to do new things or not. So uh, you have spent uh, uh, four decades in uh, analyzing uh, energy issues. So involved what is that the, Yeah, energy issues involving the customer, involving the efficient use of energy, involving uh, everything from different technologies like electric cars to air conditioners to heat pumps, but also things like light bulbs, clothes dryers, uh, home insulation, all of those things. Everything that affects a consumer from the energy perspective, that has been my focus during the past four and a half decades. So with your analysis, what change happened in the world? Uh, say that again. What what uh, states happen in the world? Uh, with your analysis of uh, energy consumption of the consumer, what change that you got in the in the society or in the world? So basically, uh, what I brought was new ideas for improving efficiency by developing more efficient technologies. But it doesn't stop there also promoting customer adoption of the new technologies by encouraging them through rebates and low interest financing to overcome the high cost barrier. So that was a big part of it was not just to develop the technology, which is efficient, but also get the customers to adopt it by giving them the right financial incentives. And then the second part was once they have the right technology, providing them the pricing signals so that when the prices are really high in the wholesale market, they would use less. And when prices are low, they would use more. Sometimes it's called load flexibility or load shifting. So changing their lifestyle a little bit to help the power system and also lower their own bills. So those were the two main, uh, you, you could say, prongs of my work. But actually, there was a third as well, which is implicit in these two, but let me mention it. The third one was just forecasting how much power they're going to use. Unless they change it, what will be their natural pattern of use? Uh, how many customers are going to be out there? Population grows, more people become customers. The economy grows, people have more income. So then they buy new technologies and new cars and so on and so forth. What will be the forecast 
of electricity consumption before we develop these new programs. So those are the three steps. First, you make the forecast of what they would do without your policies, and then you develop policies to influence that forecast in a positive way. And what are the organizations that you worked with? So I worked uh, in my career with electric utilities, uh, with energy commissions that regulate the utilities, with government agencies, and with legislative bodies. Th those were the organizations I worked with in an advisory capacity. But as far as my own uh, employment was concerned, I was working either with a research organization like the Electric Power Research Institute. I worked with them for 11 years. They are located in Palo Alto, California, and they have members from around the globe. Or I worked with various consulting firms. And then, of course, in the very beginning, I had worked with a government agency, which was the California Energy Commission. And I should mention, just as a part of the, the total picture, that I also taught economics at the University of Karachi for one year. That was before I came to the U.S. And then once I was in the U.S., at some point, I taught for four years at San Jose State University in their executive MBA program. And I also gave a lot of lectures at universities um, around the U.S., including uh, MIT, Harvard, Chicago, Northwestern, uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford, uh, and, and other universities. So, uh, what is the what is the connection that you uh, have uh, with economics and energy energy issues? Well, my connection is um, a professional connection. You know, that was my career, and that's what I did. Uh, I have written uh, more than 100 articles on the subject. Um, I have worked with utilities throughout the globe on six continents on these issues. And I have learned a lot uh, by talking to other experts. I've learned a lot from talking to customers. And I have made my share of mistakes. And I try to learn from my mistakes. Uh, as an economist, uh, we attempted sometimes to just sit in front of a computer and create models and run numbers and come up with conclusions. But sometimes they have no basis in reality. They're just in the head of the economist. So that's where mistakes are made. And so I learned that lesson that we need to talk to customers, to real people, to the decision makers in homes and in businesses and factories. We cannot just do this in a vacuum. And then the other thing I learned as an economist, it was a sobering realization that ultimately it is not just economics that we need to understand. It is also politics. And so a lot of the decisions that state agencies and government agencies make are political, even though they involve energy. They are not simply based on economics. So that was a very um, it took me 10 years, the last 10 years of my career to realize that in the end, what matters, what mattered was not the economics, but the politics. The politics had to be correct, or your recommendations would never see the light of day. And what geographic area uh, you worked for? So I worked uh, initially just in California, and then I began to work in other parts of the United States. I did a lot of work in other states like Georgia, like Missouri, like New York like Arizona, like Hawaii, like Kansas, like Illinois, like Montana, like Washington, and Connecticut, and Florida. And the list you know, just kept on growing and growing. I did not work in all 50 states, but I would say I worked at least in two dozen states. That's within the U.S. And then in Canada, I worked in Ontario quite a bit, uh, and then uh, later on in British Columbia in Alberta, in Manitoba, and then uh, to some extent in uh, Quebec, uh, yes, and then, of course, uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And also in the in the North America, in Mexico, and then in Latin America, I worked in Brazil and in Chile. In Africa, I worked in Egypt and in South, South Africa. And then in the Middle East, 
I worked um, in Saudi Arabia quite a bit. Um, I've worked uh, in Hong Kong quite a bit, on Australia and New Zealand. And, and I did a lot of conferences and communication with European countries, including uh, the UK, including Germany, and including France, Spain, and Norway, Denmark, uh, and a few others. I also did some work in Vietnam and Malaysia and a little bit in Thailand, where I didn't do any work at all, surprisingly, was Pakistan or India or Bangladesh. Even though I'm from South Asia, I never really got an opportunity to work in my native countries. That's one regret that I have. So different, different countries and different places and different energies. But the same human beings. The same human beings, the same planet, and the same sun and the same moon. And of course, different latitudes and different longitudes and different languages. Uh, but, you know, uh, what was constant was wherever I went, whichever continent it was, people always weren't happy that they were spending too much on electricity. And so it was always about energy conservation regardless of which country or which state of the U.S. I was in. That was my goal, was to help consumers lower their bills and also to ensure reliable supply of electricity. Now, even though I was working for utilities, primarily they were my clients, they also wanted happy customers. They wanted happy state government agencies. But they were not always successful, and that's why we had a lot of debates, lots of controversies, and, and those continue to this day and will probably continue for as long as there is life on planet Earth. So as a human being, uh, understanding these natural resources, uh, uh, do, you, do you feel that uh, you, uh, uh, you know, it, it, this is your life purpose? I believe in a very, very small and humble way. I have helped achieve that life purpose. But there's a lot more to be done. And the good news is we have many younger people uh, like you involved in this field and in many fields. And I think humanity is common across the globe. So we share common values. Nobody wants to waste natural resources. Most people now understand the need to mitigate climate change. Most people know that the best way to do that is to use less energy and not more, but to use it efficiently. We don't want to go back to the dark ages where there was no energy. We obviously want to live a life according to the modern technologies. But at the same time, we want to use clean energy as much as possible. And that includes solar in particular. And solar uh, is now available across the globe and people are installing solar panels on their roofs, in their houses, in their buildings, commercial buildings, even in factories, and even on top of parking lots. So we have finally figured out that the sun is always there as a source of power. Yes, it creates heat, but we can use that heat in a very sophisticated way through photovoltaic panels to produce electricity. And that electricity can run our air conditioners or fans when it gets really hot. So it's, it's a, uh, it took a humanity millennia, thousands of years to finally figure out how to convert the sun into a positive source of energy. And now that we have figured that out, we have to do as much as possible to harness the power of the sun. What you thought uh, when Elon Musk came with electric car? The electric cars are tremendous. They are um, not just a toy, which many people still think they are. Many people think they're like a golf cart, which is being sold for 10 times the price of a golf cart. I must admit, in 1979, when I first started working on these energy issues at the Electric Power Research Institute, electric cars were even being talked about back then. But that, but back then, they were really 
their golf cars. They, they were not very successful. So it took four decades or three decades before uh, Elon Musk uh, and Tesla began to produce them in large enough quantities that they became affordable. I mean, they're still expensive, but now we see a lot of electric cars on the road. They're still dominated by Tesla, in the U.S. at least. But uh, worldwide, China has now taken the lead over Tesla, and they're producing the largest number of electric cars uh, in China and exporting them to certain countries. But I think uh, electric cars that are ultimately powered by the sun will be the uh, will be the symbol of the future. So you have an electric car and you charge it during the daytime when the sun is out there and your solar panels are producing electricity, that's what you can use to charge your car. So that would be the, the best possible solution. But we're still far away from that because in the U.S., only 4% of uh, households have solar panels. And I believe the percentage of households with electric cars is even less than that, but I, 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 I'm not sure. So the numbers are very, very small, but California is way ahead of the country and ahead of most. But in Norway, I, I want to mention that 90% of the cars being sold in Norway today are electric cars. So Norway has taken absolutely the number one position. In California, I think it's more like 25% of the new cars being sold are EVs. So the progress is happening and is happening slower than we would like, but it's still happening. And I think in 10 years, you'll see something very different. So what is that major thing that you observed working in different countries with different energies? What I saw was a tendency on the part of policymakers, whether they are government officials, or their legislators do not take this seriously. They wanted to delay everything. They wanted the status quo to be there forever. They didn't want to install, for example, smart meters. And smart meters are digital meters that have a lot more capability than the traditional analog meters, which have those funny dials. So the digital display on the smart meters is amazing in terms of what it can do both for the customer and the utility. I think policymakers throughout the globe are very slow in moving on that front. But now they're catching up. They're catching up fast. In the U.S. now, we have 80% of meters today are smart meters. But only 10% of the rates, the prices that people are paying are smart prices. So we still have a ways to go when it comes to pricing reform. And progress uh, across the globe is still very limited. Many countries have retail competition. You have private companies supplying electricity, for example, uh, but they don't have smart meters. And so they cannot offer smart prices to their customers. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Now technology is too much. So how energy is playing role today? So um, technology, we have lots of innovation in technology, there is no doubt. But people adopting those technologies is the challenge. And people are not adopting them initially because they're very expensive. So we have to find a way to lower their cost, like lower the cost of solar panels, lower the cost of electric vehicles. And then we have to figure out how to educate and inform the customers that this is something worth doing. People are hesitant to do something new. Even when smartphones came out, some people didn't want to have them. And then they saw their friends and neighbors, and then they saw, oh, this is a very useful tool. And now just about everyone has a smartphone. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, my internet service is out, so I'm using the cellular plan on my smartphone for this video call. I mean, something that would be hard to imagine um, five, even five years ago. So we have to educate and inform the customers. And we have to look at how industries like Apple, how industries like Google, and how industries like Tesla, how they have changed entirely our way of thinking about life. 
And we have to, it's the same consumer that we are trying to convince to get the efficient energy equipment. But energy is not very exciting. Energy for most people is a boring subject. And so they don't think much about it. Seeing a movie on Netflix is very different than lowering your electric bill by $5 a month. And so we have to find ways to make energy an exciting topic for customers. This is a sociological or anthropological challenge that we in the electric utility industry have not been very successful at because most of our culture and mindset is engineering or economics. It is not the language of the customer. So we have to start speaking like customers speak. And to do that, we have to first learn how they speak. And we cannot learn how they speak if we just talk among experts. We are caught in, a, uh, in an echo chamber of nerves, energy nerves. And they convince each other that this is the right thing to do, but then they cannot communicate that to the customer because when they start talking to a customer, it's like Greek to the customer and the customer just shuts off their brain. So we need to do a lot of work on the human side of energy efficiency. So uh, SpaceX, NASA, and uh, uh, Japan Space uh, uh, Agency, and also Indian Space uh, uh, Company, and also different companies uh, which are working on space, uh, trying to understand the energies out of the planet. Yes. Uh, working, working, working for four decades, uh, understanding energies on the planet. Yes. What, what do yeah. you think? Where so we are I, as I, human beings? It's the undiscovered frontier, honestly. Uh, we don't know what exactly is out there. Um, and that's where the space explorations are uh, worth pursuing because we could discover new ways of living. I don't suggest, by the way, uh, some people like... Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk want to create civilization on other planets. They want people to start living on Mars and other planets. I, I think that is really way out there. It's very far-fetched. Uh, it may not happen for centuries to come. Uh, there is no oxygen on those other planets, as far as I can tell. So how would we survive on those other planets? It's an open question. So I think we can learn from space, space exploration on new technologies and how they work, etc. But I think we should keep our eyes focused on planet Earth and try to make Earth more livable. That, that's so at least what, my opinion. So what change that you observed uh, on the planet when it comes to energies? So what I'm observing is, as, as you probably know, we have these annual conferences now, uh, COP, 25 COP, 26 COP, 26. These are for uh, carbon dioxide mitigation or climate change prevention conferences. And they, uh, the last one was held, I believe, in Dubai. And, and so just the fact that these are being held tells us that the policymakers throughout the globe are giving this high priority. And, and I think change is beginning to happen. Uh, just about every country now understands the reason why climate change is bad and why climate, and what to do to slow down the pace of climate change. So those are those are the political decision, decision, decision makers and leaders. That that's uh, that's good to see that they are engaging in this conversation. So what kind of energies that you observe in in the ocean? I must admit, I don't know much about that. Uh, there is a lot of uh, conversation about ocean thermal energy conversion technologies, or OTEC, where you, you take the movement of the currents at the very different uh, elevations in the ocean, different depths in the ocean, and you try to generate power from that. But that, that um, is a supply side issue with which I'm not familiar. It has been around for at least four decades. A lot of talk about using the power of the ocean, harnessing it to produce electricity. But at this point, it is still a research uh, effort. So how the energy management should be done by the leaders of, 
all the countries i think what they should all do is instead of just talking about it which is what they do at these cop or cop conferences they should start doing some of the things that are discussed many countries use too much electricity in their buildings and homes because there is no insulation in those buildings because the windows are single pane windows and not double or triple pane windows because the attic has no insulation so we should begin with the fundamentals and start creating new houses that are highly energy efficient and the work of the rocky mountain institute in colorado uh can provide helpful guidelines to all governments around the globe their pioneering figure is emery lovins who is still very active and he's kind of a, in a sense the godfather of energy efficiency uh, he has written a lot of books and a lot of papers and people should start listening to his recommendations and then of course in the us you have all these national labs they are doing a lot of work on insulation and energy efficiency we need to spread the word and start doing this not just in the us or the developed countries but also in the developing countries with the advanced technology that we have uh, artificial intelligence how we can use this uh, for the energy uh, consumption or energy management so artificial intelligence is great it is basically able to do the computations so much faster than human beings could ever do so if a house is using too much electricity you can use ai to figure out where is the electricity going you can find out where the wastage is and you can stop the wastage you can also use ai to figure out which new technology should be installed in one particular house what is most cost effective for one house may not be cost effective for another house so that's where ai can help in screening the technologies those are just two examples and what are the energies that is going to expire i um i think you will see a lot more studies being done on human behavior and on new technologies and how the two of them interact and then we will see new studies on what new pricing options are needed to motivate customers to do the right thing and i'll give you a very simple example a lot of people don't even know that in their house they have a thermostat the thermostat controls how much electricity will be used by the air conditioner many people don't know how to program the thermostat it's already there but they don't know it's there so we need we can use ai to educate the customer through their smartphones they can automatically control their thermostat to to make life comfortable but also affordable so i think uh, i probably need to to go uh, i hope we have covered uh, most of the issues that were of interest to you and your audience and what is your observation about my work i think you are doing amazing work i really appreciate uh, the kinds of programs you have and uh, i would like to see how this program turns out and then i will share it with others as well so best wishes for you in your work and happy to talk again at some point and one last question so i did masters in software engineering also bachelor's in computer science and engineering right now i'm doing some devops engineering and software development projects for uk and uh, us companies remotely from india so uh, me talking with experts like you who are already in different industries who are working on different projects and trying to understand and trying to solve uh, uh, business problems and also uh, countries problems what i'm going to learn and how this uh, collection of uh, knowledge is going to helpful for me uh, in my future I'm sure it will and feel free to reach out to me for a, a follow up conversations via email or linkedin as 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 you are doing I wish you the very best and I'll put this video on my youtube channel with your permission yes absolutely and send me a link once you have done it uh, uh, can I also put this audio and video clip on my podcast website internet social media everywhere with your permission sure yes yeah uh, do you want to share your web links with my audience who are listening to this Actually I don't have a web link I just have my LinkedIn uh, I am on on Twitter uh, I have not created my own website sure, But what I do is much. I put it on I put it on LinkedIn Twitter and Facebook and sometimes on Instagram
Uh, I'll share those uh, in my website. People who find uh, my website can able to uh, follow you and can uh, see learn from you. So it sounds good. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, sir, again for your valuable time. My my pleasure, sir. All the best to you. Take care, sir. Thank you.